عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه إن شاء الله we will continue reading in this book الشمائل المحمدية والخصائل المصطفوية by uh, إمام الترمذي رحمه الله تعالى which is a book of uh, hadith pertaining to the description of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and last time we began reading from the second chapter of this book which is Babu Maja'a fi Khatami Nubuwa this is a chapter that deals with the seal of prophethood uh, so today inshallah we'll continue with hadith number uh, 17 which is عن جابر بن سمرة رضي الله تعالى عنه قال رأيت الخاتم بين كتفي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم غدة حمراء مثل بيضة الحمامة So on the authority of Jabir ibn Samura may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him who said I saw the seal the khatam the seal between the shoulders of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it was a piece of flesh uh, that was red in color and it resembled the egg of a pigeon. So this is another report that shows us that there was this physical feature on the body of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, which was essentially a raised uh, portion of the flesh on the back, upper back of the Prophet wasallam, in between the shoulders, a little further to the left from the center. Not exactly in the center, a little bit towards the left, as we talked about last week. And this report tells us that it was a red in color. But there are other reports that say that it was a black in color. There are other reports that say that it was green in color. There are other reports that say that it was the same complexion as the rest of his body, meaning pinkish, rosy color. So how do we make sense of all of these different reports? Well, simply because it seems to change color. Like it often happens even on you know, different growths that happen on our body, that it goes through different shades of color. So this uh, growth on the back of the Prophet وسلم, which was permanent, but it used to vary in its color. So this particular companion, when he saw it, it was red in color. And he described its size by saying that it was like the egg of a pigeon. So the size of the egg of a pigeon. But the size also is something that seems to have varied because other companions have given descriptions of slightly smaller sizes. So it seems that it also used to perhaps swell and shrink, but it was always there in some form or another. Uh, and as we talked about last time, that this is something that was a sign of his prophethood, because it was mentioned in the earlier scriptures of the Jews and the Christians that a prophet will come in this area, in this region, and he will have many different signs. And one of the physical signs that was mentioned was that he would have this lump of flesh between his shoulders. And when we talk about, inshallah, next week, we will talk about the story of Salman al farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We will see how those who were learned in the previous scriptures knew about this particular uh, feature of the upcoming prophet and that's why Salman al farisi came looking for that as we will see uh, next week insha'Allah ta'ala. This was a physical feature of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that existed in between his shoulders and many companions got to see it with their own eyes and among them is Jabir ibn Samura as he describes it in this report. The next report which is hadith number 18 is uh, from a female companion uh, whose name was Rumaytah رضي الله تعالى عنها <coughs> She says قالت سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم ولو أشاء أن أقبل الخاتم الذي بين كتفيه من قربه لفعل يقول لسعد بن معاذ يوم مات اهتز له عرش الرحمن 
So now, this is a report by Rumaita, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and she says, I heard the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying the following with my own ears. Okay? So her point is to tell you what she heard the Prophet ﷺ saying. But she digresses in the middle of the sentence. And she says, وَلَوْ أَشَاءُوا أُقَبِّلَ الْقَاتَمَ الَّذِي بَيْنَ كَتِفَيْنٍ قُرْبِهِ لَفَعَلْ That I was, when I heard these words that I'm about to tell you from the Prophet ﷺ, I was standing so close to him that if I wanted to, I could have kissed the seal that existed between his shoulders. Okay? So, and then she said what she heard from the Prophet ﷺ, which is not of significance for us right now. Okay? I'll tell you what it was, but this is what we want to highlight. That, because that's what Imam al that's why he's bringing this hadith here. This is yet another eyewitness account from another companion that she says that I, I was standing so close to the Prophet ﷺ that if I wanted to, I could have kissed the seal of the prophethood that existed between his shoulders. So, another proof that this was real, this existed. And then she says that, what did she hear the Prophet ﷺ saying? She heard him saying, Sa'ad, she heard him saying, on the day when Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed away, he said that the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shook the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been shook, has been shaken up. What is she talking about? Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala anhu, for those of you who don't know him, he is one of the greatest companions of the Prophet sallallahu One of the leaders of the Ansar, one of the major leaders of the Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad was one of the first people in Medina who accepted Islam when the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'adh ibn Jabb Mus'ab ibn Umayr to Medina as his convoy to go and preach it is before Hijra. He sent Mus'ab ibn Umayr to go to Medina and start preaching the message. Mus'ab ibn Umayr when he arrived in Medina, one of the first people that he spoke to was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, when he heard Musab ibn Umayr preaching, he entered Islam immediately. And when he entered Islam, he went to his tribe. He was the leader of his tribe. He was from the Aus. He was one of the sub, sub-tribal leaders of Aus. He went to his tribe and he called the people to a meeting and he convinced them to accept Islam. And they entered Islam because of their respect for Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. If Saad is saying this is the truth, it has to be the truth. So that night, overnight, almost half of the city of Medina accepted Islam. Because of Saad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then later on, Saad ibn Mu'adh has many, many wonderful feats that he achieved in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stood up for him one time. And he said, Qumu li sayyidikum. When Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh entered the gathering, the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, Stand up for your chief, for your leader, for your Sayyid. So when this great companion of the Prophet ﷺ was injured in the battle of Khandaq, in the battle of the trench, he fought in Badr, he fought, and he has a wonderful speech that he gave in Badr. He fought in Uhud, he fought in Khandaq. In Khandaq he was shot with an arrow on a vein shot right on the vein that led to his death. But he made dua that, Ya Allah, please do not let me die until I see the, um, the uh, ending of Banu Quraiba. Because Banu Quraiba had uh, uh, betrayed the Muslims on the day of Khandaq. And he knew, he expected the Prophet to punish them. So he said, Ya Allah, please give me life until I see the outcome of Banu Quraiba. And he did live until the Prophet ﷺ gave his final verdict about Banu Quraiba, and then after that he died. When he died, he was he had a reputation of being a heavy man. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh had a reputation of being a heavy man. When they were carrying his janazah, it seemed to be very light. It was so significant that it became the talk of the town that Sa'ad's janazah was so light. We used to hear that he was a heavy man. 
And the munafiqeen started to mock him, talk about him mockingly. That, oh, you know, uh, we used to hear that he's a big, heavy man. He's such a light, frail, weak person. When the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he said they don't know what they're talking about. Because when Sa'ad passed away, angels descended from the heavens, welcoming Sa'ad. And they helped to carry the janazah of Sa'ad, which is why it was light on the shoulders. And in that context, the Prophet ﷺ said that even the throne of Ar-Rahman has shaken up out of excitement to welcome Sa'ad to the heavenly realm. This is how blessed this companion was, radiallahu ta'ala And that's what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about here. On the day that Sa'ad ibn Mu'az passed away, the Prophet ﷺ made that remark. He says, لَلَهُ عَرْشُ Rahman That for him, the throne of Ar-Rahman shook up. You know, like, like when you get excited, you get shaken up. It's as if, you know, the throne is excited to welcome Sa'ad ibn Mu'az to the heavenly realm. رضي الله تعالى عنه. So uh, Rumaita is saying that when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, made this remark, made this statement, I was standing right next to him, so close that if I wanted to, so I could have kissed the seal of the prophethood that existed in between his shoulders. The whole point of Imam Tirmidhi bringing this report here is to show you yet another eyewitness account that this lump of flesh existed on his back. And it was known to be the seal of prophethood, a physical uh, a symbol that he was the seal of all the prophets, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The next report is on the authority of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Says, كَانَ عَلِيٌّ إِذَا وَصَفَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فذكر الحديث بقوله وقال بين كتفي خاتم النبوة وهو خاتم النبيين. That Sayyidina Ali رضي الله تعالى عنه when he would describe the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and this is a long hadith that has come before in the first chapter so he skips the rest of the hadith and jumps to just that one phrase where Ali said that in between his shoulders was the seal of prophethood and he was the seal of all the prophets. So Sayyidina Ali is another one who has uh, reported uh, the existence of this seal that existed on his back. The next report, hadith number 20, is on Abi Zayd, Amr ibn Akhtab al-Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, qala, qala li Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya Aba Zayd, udnu minni tamsah zahri, famasahtu zahrahu, fawaqa'at asabi'i ala al-khatam, قُلْتُ وَمَا الْخَاتَمْ قَالَ الشَّعَرَاتٌ مُجْتَمِعَاتٌ So this companion of the Prophet Wasallam, Abu Zayd, Amr ibn al-Aqtab uh, al-Ansari, he says that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to me one day, Ya Abu Zayd, come close to me and uh, put your hand on my back and wipe my back. So I put my hand on the back of the Prophet Wasallam and I felt his back and my fingers uh, uh, came upon the seal. So the one who is listening to this Sahabi talking about this, he says, what seal? What seal are you talking about? He's hearing it for the first time. So the companion says, it was a, a um, uh, collection of hair. Shi'aratun mujtami'at. Hair gathered together. So here, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, does not show his back to the companion for whatever reason, maybe because he was wearing something that if he shows his back it would expose his aura, so he doesn't want to, or maybe you know, stitch clothing is hard to take off, whatever the case may be, he doesn't want to show his back. So he simply tells him, put your hand inside my, my shirt, put your hand inside and feel my back. Maybe the companion had asked to see it. Maybe the Prophet simply wanted to show him. The hadith doesn't tell us. But the fact is that he put his hand inside and touched the back, which shows us that it is permissible for a man to touch the back of another person when there is a need. There is nothing wrong with that. Uh, and then he said that what I felt was shahrat al-mujtama'at, which tells us that the seal was a raised piece of flesh and it also had hair around it. 
It had hair around it. That, that's what he felt, and that's what he described in this report. The next report is a long one that we will skip until next time, inshallah ta'ala, because it has the story of Salman al-Farisi. So next time we'll spend the entire time talking about this one. But the next two are short, so let me just do those, and then last, next week we'll come back and do the one we're skipping today. So hadith number 22 is an Abi Uqay al-Dawraqi radiallahu ta'ala anhu an Abi Nabrat al-Awafi radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala سألت أبا سعيد الخدري رضي الله تعالى عنه أن خاتم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعني خاتم النبوة فقال كان في ظهري بضعة ناشزة أو بضعة ناشزة. So on the authority of Abu Nabra al Awafi who said I asked the great companion Abu Sa'id al Khudri may Allah be pleased with him about the seal of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. And here, the narrator pauses and says, I mean the seal of prophethood. Why is he clarifying? Because the Prophet ﷺ also had a khatam, a ring, that had a seal on it, that he used to seal his letters with. So when he is saying that I asked him about his seal, he wants to clarify, I'm not talking about the seal that was on his finger that he used to wear to seal his letters. I'm talking about the seal of prophethood. So I asked Abu Sa'id al-Khudri about the seal of prophethood. And then Abu Sa'id al-Khudri responded and said, That the seal of prophethood was on his back. And like we said earlier, it was on the upper back, slightly towards the left from the center. Bab'atan nashida, Protruding flesh. So it was a protruding piece of flesh right on his upper back. And the next hadith, which is hadith number 23, which is the last hadith of this chapter, and that's what we're going to stop with, inshallah, is an Abdullah ibn Sargis, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, qala, Asaytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa huwa fi unasim min ashabihi, fadurtu haqada min khalfihi, fa'arafa alladhi urid, fa'alqa al-rida'a an zahrihi, fara'aytu mawda'a al-khatami ala katifayhi mitla al-jum'i hawlaha khilanun ka'annaha sa'alih. فرجعت حتى استقبلته فقلت غفر الله لك يا رسول الله فقال ولك فقال القوم استغفر لك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال نعم ولكم ثم تلا هذه الآية واستغفر لذنبك وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات. So on the authority of Abdullah ibn Sarjis, may Allah be pleased with him, who said, I came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم while he was among a group of his companions. So I went around to his back. I went around to his back. And so he says that the Prophet ﷺ realized what I wanted. The Prophet ﷺ realized what I wanted. So he lowered his upper garment, Rida. The Rida is, you know, how like when you wear the ihram, you have the lower garment and the upper garment. So the Rida is the upper garment. Oftentimes, the Prophet ﷺ used to wear an izar, a wraparound, and on top of it, a rida that doesn't have sleeves, you just put it on, so you can easily take it off. So he was wearing a rida. When this companion comes behind him, the Prophet ﷺ realizes why he's behind me. He's heard about this seal, he wants to see it with his own eyes. So he lowers his rida. He lowers the upper garment to make it easier for the companion to see his upper back. So. The, the companion says that I saw the, um, the seal of prophethood between his shoulders uh, like a fist. What he means is just like when you make a fist, you have lines, lines on your fist that are the, you know, the joints between the fingers. It was like that. There were these lines on the uh, protruding flesh that was the seal on his back. And it was surrounded by moles, the beauty spot, the, mo, the mo, black mold, beauty spot. And then he says, I came back around to the front. After I saw the seal, I came back around to the front and I said to him, Ya Rasulullah, may Allah forgive you. So he, this is a way of thanking someone. He's making dua for the Prophet. Uh, because the Prophet just did a favor to him. 
So he's saying, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهُ May Allah forgive you, Ya Rasulullah. This is not, this is dua. This is like we say, جَزَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا, right? So he's saying, غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَكَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهُ May Allah forgive you, Ya Rasulullah. Allah. Making dua for him. The Prophet ﷺ says to him, وَلَكَ And you also. And you also. May Allah forgive you also. He's making dua for him, so he responds back with a dua as well. When, when the companion said this, the, his students who are hearing this hadith from him, his students said, Istakhara laka Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu sought forgiveness for you. This is not a simple matter. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asks forgiveness from Allah for you, you know his dua is going to be answered. So they're amazed. They're like, wow, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sought forgiveness for you. That means you're forgiven. He sought forgiveness for you. So the companion said, yes, he did seek forgiveness for me. And he also sought forgiveness for all of you. And then he recited this ayah of the Qur'an in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Seek forgiveness for your own sins and for the believing men and the believing women. This is a command from Allah to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So don't you think he's going to fulfill the command of Allah? Naturally. So he must have sought forgiveness for all the believing men and women. And that's why the companion is trying to make them feel good by saying, look, he didn't just do it for me, he did it for all of you as well. Wallahu ta'ala ala wa sallillahu wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa sallam.